I wrote the first draft of the 10 Point Platform and Program, but we didn't have a name for it. We had no name for it. The 10 Point Platform and Program, we want power to determine our own destiny. We want full employment for our people. We want decent housing fit for shelter for human beings. We want decent education to us about our true history. We wanted our uh, end to the robbery of our black communities by the avaricious corporate private capitalists. Uh, what was it? Six, we want all black men and women to be exempt from military service. We changed that later on to free preventative medical health care. Number seven, end police brutality and murder of black people. Number eight, right to have jurors of our own peers for all black men and women who are in jails and prisons have been tried by all white jurors and so on. And summed the program up with the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America. When in the course of human, I just thought it was great. I said, Huey, come downstairs to me. I said, look at this, man. It says, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for anyone to I said, now we can change this a little bit and kind of paraphrase it, whatever, et cetera. When in the course of human events, listen to it, becomes necessary for any one people to dissolve the political bondage which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the step in an equal state in which the laws of nature, nature's God, entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of humankind, dictate that they should declare the causes which impel them to dissolve that political bondage. When a long train of abuses and usurpations pursues and invariably evinces a design to reduce a people under absolute despotism, then it is the right of the people to alter, change that government, and provide new guard for their future security and happiness. Right, yeah. The Declaration of Independence. <laughs> or as you say, just a white man's knowledge. I said, no, that's my knowledge. <laughs> Why could you say that? I said, one plus one equal two, the white man's knowledge. I said, that's just a fact. Do you know a mathematical fact yet? And then, of course, in dialectics, you know, I always taught part of it. We use dialectics. We don't use method. We like to do research. Quantitative increase, quantitative decrease, cause the quality of legal change. You had to know and understand that when you came around me and doing organizing in the community. The increased amount of time you sell a Black Panther Party newspaper in the designated area where you sell it. And over and over and over you sell it in an increased amount of time you talk to the brothers and sisters that you're doing. You are decreasing the apathy and increasing the consciousness. So that's what it was about. How do you educate the people about programs, about organizing, and unify the people? And we came up with all these programs, beginning with the Free Breakfast Children Program, Six Cell Negro Testing Program, Free Preventative Medical Health Care Clinics. That's what we started with. But party members from Seattle, Washington, to Winston, State of North Carolina, to Boston with Sister Archie Jones, who run that chapter up there, to Chicago, where they got creative with the whole concept of grassroots community programs. I looked up, and Winston Salem has got a free ambulance program. I said, it ain't right on. I haven't even thought of that, but I said, right on. I looked up in Boston, and then and Sister Archie Jones got a free pharmacy program. Hey, right on. Richmond, Virginia got a, Richmond, Virginia had a free pest control program. Next thing you know, we have 22. 24, and they expanded even after that. Programs in the community to organize and unify the people around. All growing out of the foundation of the 10 point platform and program of my Our Black Panther Party. Right. That 10 point platform and program. Yeah. You know, even when we wrote that program, I said, now, Huey, we don't want to write some long, dissertative kind of stuff. He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know how some brothers and sisters, they're educated and stuff. But they try to talk to the grassroots brothers and people. And they say, the basic socioeconomic structure, the adverse conditions that you're subjected to, and consider the particular sociological and psychological factors. You know, oh, uh, and the brother, the brother, he said, hey, brother Bobby, what are you talking about, man? <laughs> when you get down to the you get playing with brothers and sisters. Then they understand. And that's why we wrote the Chinchmore program and tried to stay away from that dissertative kind of lingering in language. But that program, as it's been said tonight already, is just as relevant today That's as right. it was then. And I mean that in a more profound way. This, this, this particular movement, this particular Occupy Wall Street movement, and that in my last three speaking engagements just this fall, I mean, I walked in, and the first thing I say to these five or six or seven hundred students where I'm speaking at, Occupy Wall Street! And the whole crowd jumped right on, and they just 
entertain. And then finally, on the internet, they put out the first, what, 40 some odd points of, of what they were issuing about. And I read them all. I said, wow, what these guys are talking about, every point in the 10 point platform and program fits right into everything they're talking about. The unemployment, the high needs of housing, et cetera, so it's right there. So, you know, our party evolved to have a broader class analysis rather than a race only analysis. We understood how to look at the broader class analysis of what was happening. So, that became literally a, a, a stepping stone point for us really to begin to expand the great characteristics of the Black Panther Party was so great when we got coalitions going, other organizations such as the Red Guard and Ewa Kuhn with the young Chinese Asians and uh, Asian Student Alliance that Richard Aoki started up in, uh, it was another organization, uh, the Young Lords Political Party and, and, and uh, AIM American Indian Movement, all wrote their own 10, 12, or 14 programs modeling after what we had written but more specifically to their inner culture and their community and, their, and what was happening. And so that 10-point platform and program is, is basic. I mean, it's really no different from a lot of civil rights organizations and other organizations, except that we in the Black Panther Party really says we believe in the right to self-defense. Right. And I guess that's what captured the imagination, not only a lot of people, but captured the imagination of the white racist power subject. These Negroes talking about defending themselves. Well, I'll be darned. <laughs> you know what I mean? They called me one day over to do a television show in San Francisco, Race Relations in America. And I, I took my 10 point platform and program, but also took 500 of the 3,000 racist letters that had been sent to us in the Black Panther Party. I'd given a directive somewhere back then that all racist letters to all chapters and branches got to be sent in so we can give it to our lawyers because that would be evidence in the courtroom for our right to defend ourselves, you know what I mean? And so I took these letters over to the host and I dumped them out there and he says, why are you dumping these letters? I said, you the one got a program up there called Race Relations in America. This is a bunch of racist Ku Klux Klan, Nazis, everybody here, talking about killing and murdering us Black Panthers. They're going to hang us, they're going to do this, blah, 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 blah. And I says, boom. I says, now, what you need to do, I told the host, look at these letters. I said, there ain't no return addresses on none of them. No return addresses on none of them. I says, now, all you peace-loving people, whether you're white, black, blue, red, green, yellow, purple, dot, I'm ready to say something. But you peace-loving people, I ain't talking about you. I'm talking about these hardcore racists here. Every racist who sent this, first, my home address is 809 7th Street. You ain't got no address on yours. I said, Headquarters address is so and so. I gave my 10 addresses for the Black Panther Party's office and headquarters. I said, now when you come to shoot, kill, and murder us, when you come, remember, we have shotguns, we got pistols, and we will exercise the right to defend ourselves. So when you start shooting at us, we shoot them back. My point is, we have to stand up to defend ourselves. Talk about defending our constitutional, democratic, civil, human right to organize our people, to raise the consciousness of our people, to unify our people. That's all we were talking about. This wasn't no macho stuff out there. Man. Uh uh. You had to be disciplined. Even when we took the first guns out in the streets, we disciplined all the brothers and sisters. How you cannot point to the gun? Point to the law they had to know about the guns. You cannot point a loaded weapon and all this kind of stuff. I mean, this is the kind of stuff we talked to. And I'll never forget that day when we first went out there and got that first real disciplined, organized patrol together. And that cop says, you have no right to observe me. 50, 60 people standing on the sidewalk. And he says, no, California State Supreme Court ruling states that every citizen has the right to stand and observe a police officer carrying out their duty as long as they stand a reasonable distance away. Reasonable distance in that particular room is constituted 8 to 10 feet. I'm standing approximately 20 feet from you and we'll observe you whether you like it or not. And some sister on the sidewalk say, well, go ahead on and attack. <laughs> the, cop said, the, cop, the cop says, is that gun loaded? He would say, if I know it's loaded or not. He said, well, I have a right. He would say, step back. You have no right. He went off. Such a Supreme Court word, somebody versus so and so and so. That was my private property. You cannot remove my private property from it without due process of law. Step back. You cannot touch my weapon. The tall brother standing there, he said, man, 
What kind of Negroes is these? <laughs>
Well, I started eating that soup. I generally throw it in the toilet. The soup and bread. Yeah, instead of eating the soup and bread, I eat the uh, crackers and drink some milk. Sometime uh, I might take two or three spoons of the soup yeah. and have some green salad. Sometimes they chop up and throw on a plate. And uh, if, it's, if it's got any kind of dressing on it, I'll eat it. If it don't, I throw it, I generally throw it away. Like if you really had your choice of what you would eat, you know, if you're really in there, you know. Like last time you said you wanted some, you know, some soul food. And if you would, you know, and you went into this whole thing of describing yeah. what, well, you know, what would you eat if you could have something to eat? Well, I'm a cook. I can cook, see. So what would you cook? Well, I'd cook. If I was out of jail, I like to, I've been in jail now about six months. I like to go home and uh, get my wife and we'll go down to uh, the co-op market somewhere and uh, we'll buy uh, some cube steaks, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Some nice little thick cube steaks, you know? And uh, bell peppers, onions, and all this other stuff, you know? And I'd go home, I'd do the cooking more than likely. Me and we cook together. But you do most of the cooking at all? No, I don't do most of the cooking. I would do the cooking when I really want to eat something that I want to eat, you know, uh, the way I want to cook. When she she can cook, she learned how to cook. When she first met, all she could cook was spaghetti, see. <laughs> so uh, I do 50% of the cooking now. She learned how to cook, you know, uh, by me helping her, teaching her how to cook, you know. Well, I had to learn how to cook when I was in L.A., when I was living by myself, see. And uh, well, I had to learn how to cook what I could. You see, because I really didn't have no money. I was hung up one time and just broke, you know. But uh, what I cook is uh, I take me some cube steaks, flour them down, season salt them down, pepper them down, and uh, uh, then I douse them in uh, some flour and I put them in a pan of hot grease, you know, about four of them. And uh, if they brown on one side, I flip them over. Then I'd cut up a whole onion, slice rings, onion, rings of onions, and I'd cut up some rings of bell pepper, you know, and then uh, drop a lid on top of it, you know, <laughs> and lower the flat fire down, you know, and let it go slow. And uh, meanwhile, the uh, ham end or bacon end is already boiling. It's already been boiling at least, you know, 30 minutes, you know, mm -hmm. on a high fire. And I drop uh, some, uh, either some fresh shell, black eyed peas in there. But a frozen black eyed peas, which I prefer, you know. Actually, I've been put them on before I dropped the meat in, you know, because the way I'm going to do this. But uh, I got these black eyed peas going, you know, with a little bell pepper in there, you know. And uh, I uh, would uh, season it down righteous, you know, black pepper and all that stuff. I like highly seasoned stuff, you know. Then I got this pan of rice aroni cooking. See, I've got this three or four slabs of butter in the bottom of this pan. Is, just melting, and I throw this rice around, let it brown over, you know, and, and boom, throw all this stuff in, and I take three tomatoes, four, uh, one tomato, you know, after the rice steams up inside, you know, I put the water in, put the little herbs and all this stuff, this beef rice around it, you see, and after it comes up, I take a tomato on top of the rice, I stir it up, and then let it steam a little bit, and I take a tomato and slice it all up, and put the slices all over the top of the, uh, uh the, uh, uh rice and put the lid back on it, you know, and let it sit there, you know, real low fine, let that juices from the tomatoes simmer down into the rice, you see? And uh, I have some cornbread, you know, <laughs> and uh, I like a tall, cold glass of milk, you see? And uh, when that cornbread is hot, and the rice aroni is hot, you know, and everything is cooking, what I do, I take the meat out of the pan, and I put four or five tablespoons of pot, uh, flour in the bottom of the pan, uh, it'd be equated with the amount of uh, grease, you know, and the juices and seeped out of the meat, you know, into that, you know, it's kind of cooked too, you know. And you let the flour brown, you see. And then that's when I go to my thing, you know, I get me a half a bottle of steak sauce, you know, and dump it in there, some hot sauce and dump it in there, and some peppers out of a jar and dump it in there, a little more seasoning sauce, salt it down and taste it, you know, you have to taste your food, you see. It tastes good, boom. And take all the meat and put it back in the pan, you see. Cut up a few more onions, a few more bell peppers, you see. Tomato, maybe, you know. Boom, and put the uh, lid back on there and just let it simmer there, you know what I mean, for about 20 minutes. Everything is nice and hot. And that's what I have, some cornbread with butter 
in between it, some black eyed peas, the ham ends, the bacon ends, or whatever you got in there, or a ham hock, you have to boil it a little early, you know what I mean, get it done, you know, and I agree, man. <laughs> I'd like to get down to it. That's, that's where it's at to me. Country brown, uh, cube steak smothered down in country brown, country brown gravy. Uh-huh. Black eyed peas and rice around it with all the gravy I want to put on it, you know, with all the way I got it seasoned just the way I like it. And a tall glass of milk. And, uh, I can see why you threw your simple way after all that. I mean, I, that's, I like to eat. You know, one time, a long time ago, somebody asked me what I'd rather have. I was down in Los Angeles at the time when I was trying to make it 10 years ago. And uh, he asked me what I'd rather have. Would I rather have a Cadillac or would I rather have a, uh, a refrigerator full of food, you know? And you know, you think about this, you know, um, I like to eat, you know, when I was growing up, we didn't have a lot of these things, you know. we get a piece of steak, uh, it was a little bitty piece of steak and it was far and far in between, you know. And Mama would hustle up a skinny chicken for Sunday, you see. And Daddy, he's around working here and there, but uh, we didn't get much meat. We eat a lot of greens and black-eyed peas and cornbread. You what know, was that in Oakland? Yeah, I raised up right out there in Berkeley, Cornelius Village, the ghetto over there. Were you in Cornelius Village? I lived I remember there. that. Remember the Busy Bee Cafe? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> you talking about on Ninth and uh, what's yeah. it? Harrison. Yeah. Yeah, I lived on Sixth and Harrison. And they finally tore that place down. Yeah, I know they tore the whole place down. That's where we was raised up at. Man. And uh, see, I remember my mom used to bring in and stuff. And I think about people who are hungry, you know. And uh, I think about people. Uh, that's why Breakfast for Children is where it's at, man, you know. Mm-hmm. Because in the morning, like you eating grits, I, mean, I, like, I like to eat breakfast, you know what I mean? I want three or four slices of some of that, some thick bacon, you know what I mean? I don't like it a little dainty, thin bacon, but I eat it, you know, it's sweet and it's good, you know. But uh, some grits and some butter, you know what I mean, some hot biscuits or some jelly or some syrup, one way or the other, you know what I mean. And uh, that's the way it's at, and I think every little kid in the country should have it, you know. Sausages if he wanted, uh, ham slabs and grits and butter and jelly and biscuits. You know, we make toast with placing the butter, this is where I was raised up. You put the butter on the uh, uh, bread, you know. I don't dig toaster bread. Toaster, you know, we put, you know, they take the toast and they put it in a little toaster, you know. Well, I ain't the way we do it. I wasn't where I was raised because we didn't have no toasters. So we had to put it under the flame in the oven, you know. And we still do it. But we like it that way. We're so used to it tasting spats of butter on top of the bread and sliding it in the oven, you dig? And then it toasts right, nice and hot, and the toast is nice, and the butter melts down, and you come in nice and hot, you know what I mean? And I hated margarine, you know? The reason I hated margarine, even when I was a kid, I knew it was a fake, you see? And uh, it wasn't real butter, you see what I mean? And I kind of adopted this from my daddy. He didn't want nobody's margarine. He wanted real butter. And my mother likes real butter, you know? They come up, they, they was come up on the farm when they was young, too, you know? And um, butter, man, on that rice, and scramble eggs or sunny side up eggs. Just take me some pile of rice with all the butter in it I want and two, three sunny side up eggs on top of that. And some smoked sausages or some bacon. What about in the jail? Do you ever talk about this food? In oh, man. I talked about this one night, man. The cats told me to be quiet. <laughs> I got to talking one time and describing the meal. You know, I was hollering down the block to some other brothers that I talked to. Los Siete. Yeah, Los Siete and them brothers. And they get to describe and stuff, you know. They was talking about how they make chili. I make chili too, you know, roast beef, all that stuff. Stew, love to cook stew. Like when we in the Panther party, you know, Panther House? Uh-huh. Drop over to the Panther House, or at my house, up at the top of the Panther headquarters office, you know. Got a kitchen back there. That's where it's at. <laughs> I mean, you know, you grease, you know. <laughs> and so I tell the brothers there's some chili, you know. And everybody gets together and we eat food is, is life, man, you know. And I relate, I relate to things, you know. That. What, what about Los Fiestas? You, you can't see any other prisoners, can you? No, only time I see them, Casman, is when uh, they lawyer. Well, they lawyer is my lawyer. They, they, you know, I call them out, but one of the lawyers working along with Gary as a crew will call them out and they pass by oh, myself. I mean, anybody, you see any of the other prisoners where you are? Yeah, I can see them when they pass by myself. Uh-huh. Or when they come down to take a shower, they might have a shower day like tomorrow, see, on mm-hmm. Saturday. And uh, they'll come down and the process of them taking that five, quick five minute shower. See, this shower cell is kind of like next to my cell, but it's to my left. I really can't see in the shower. But as they come and get ready to go in, they say, power, Bobby, you know, what's happening, brother? I say, right on, you know. 
if Mr. Ramos, you know, we would win. And uh, we'd be talking about a lot of things, man. We'd talk about the fact that we've uh, got to raise defense funds and things like that, you know. And uh, the fact that the people struggle out there in the streets, what's happening, you know. And we got to organize the people and let the people organize around the programs and unify around these programs, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, breakfast for Children, Free Health Clinic, all of them. You think the prisoners in there understand, you know, that most of them are most of them hip to what you're talking about? I think a lot of them are not motivated. Uh, I think uh, a lot of them just don't know really, they know some kind of way, but they're not able to articulate how it's really the power structure. You know, the avaricious, greedy businessmen and the demagogic power, they're not how, here. How, how do you know this? How, how do, do I know? Yeah. I mean, how does it make itself evident? It makes itself evident that uh, you can distinguish between two different kinds of prisoners, you know. You can distinguish the kind of prisoner who has some political thinking. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you do that? When you first come into the cell block, when you walk on there, how do you know which, which uh, prisoners have a political consciousness and which are the other ones? Some of them, a lot of them ask me, brother, what's going on? They just don't know. You know, they know me, they heard about me, you know, they heard about the party, you know, they heard about Huey and all of us, you know, contributing together. And uh, they just outright asked you, you know, what's going on, you see. It's a lot of them. Do they yell it down the halls or do they? Well, they might pass by the cell or they're waiting to come out this little gate to come out and see their lawyer. They might be there about two or three minutes, you know. I rap to them, you know, stuff like that. They ask me questions. Then there's brothers that know a lot of what's happening, you know. And he comes right on in, you know, he'd be talking about uh, what Regan did and what you think about that. And he just, you know, relating his knowledge, we trade knowledge like, you know. And uh, he's talking about the fact that the budget for welfare in the state is lower than the budget for prisons, you know. These brothers know this. He's on all this information? Yeah, man, these cats, lots of, some cats know this stuff, man. It's, uh, you know, and uh, it's very important stuff. Regan, you know, indir directly and indirectly, man, However, all the rejects, and these cats are hip, all the rejects on the adult authority, the cats are rejects, man. Mad dog, mad and the ex-policemen, ex-DAs, you know. They kind of rejects, you know, they ain't got, and they, they, run the, they run the prison system, man. They're rejects from where? Rejects in terms of uh, not being the best educated to run the prisons, or not being the best educated in society, you see what I mean? Last time we were talking about, though, what it was like in the hole, and that was sort of graphic, and we missed that. Would you go over that again in all the way you told it, you know, all your expressions and everything about what it was like in, when you were in the hole? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Y'all got no smoke, have you? Uh, cigarette? Anybody got a cigarette? Don't, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Just like one right there. Yeah, you got a match? Uh, well, well, I was put in a hole. Well, I have to tell you how it started. You see, this, um, this uh, guard gave me, or uh, let me have Black Panther Party paper. Yeah, there you go. After Gary had requested, you know, him to let me have it. And uh, I took the paper. Gary had told the guard that he wanted me to read over three or four articles because they're gonna really, he wanted me to make some notes on them and stuff like that and some of my statements and everything. He said because uh, he felt that in some of the couple of future cases that the DA was gonna try to turn the meaning of them around. So he wanted to get them down now, you know. And uh, I took the paper, God let me have it. It was one night when my lawyer came up to see me. And uh, next day, or two days later I think, uh, I was in visiting and so I come back from visiting. Visiting was over for that Sunday. That's what it was. And the cat told me, he says, uh, Seal, you ain't supposed to have that Black Panther Party paper now. I said, wait a minute, man. I say, uh, it's another guard, you know. I say, you just investigate. I say, one of the guys let me have the paper, you know. That's contraband. I said, oh, man, wait a minute. I say, if a guard gave it to me, I said, he gave it to me after request my lawyer to make some notes for some legal matters, you know. That don't make no difference. I said, no, wait a minute. I said, you're supposed to investigate, you know what I mean? And what you doing with the Jet Magazine? I said, what Jet Magazine, you know? He said, we found a Jet Magazine. I said, no, I said, you ain't found no Jet Magazine. He said, we got a I said, look, man, I saw all these cats is running around here. They're going to visit and stuff like this. Yeah, I said, the cats probably threw the Jet Magazine. I said, because they're always giving me something. They're always throwing something in here, you know? 
And he says, well, that's contraband. I said, well, man, I say, that's one thing. I said, but uh, as far as the paper go, he said, well, you're going to get your visit taken. I said, no, wait a minute, man. I said, you've got to investigate. And he says, no. He says, we don't have to do nothing. I said, well, then if you don't investigate, I said, that means you violate my rights by taking my business away. I said, so if you don't investigate, you're a bunch of low-life, discovery, reprobated pigs. I said, and I don't go for it. And uh, that's the way I feel about it. And so, uh, well, you can't call us a pig. We'll take visits away from you from next week and next week just for that. I say pig a thousand times, pigs a million times. As long as you violate my constitutional rights or my rights to my visit, any kind of human rights I got, I say just because you won't investigate, I say you can solve the stuff. I say I consider you a pig until you do. And so uh, they didn't like it. And uh, cats started to argue with me, talking with me. I had some cups in there. There's an extra cup in, in my cell, you see? And uh, the cat with the food wagon, see, they feed you in your cell. He went around out on D block, on A block. He come in on D block. He happened to went around out on A block instead of coming back out and picking up my cup. Because, see, I'm outside of the lockup for D block. You see, I'm in an isolated cell away from everybody, see? What are you doing with these cups in your cell? This cup here in your cell. What you going to do, write something for your lawyer? I look at this dude. I say, look, man, I say, uh, how can you be so stupid to ask such an unintelligible question as that as to be supposedly writing something for a lawyer with a damn cup? I say, now, how can you be that stupid, man? I say, I'm, not, I say, I'm more intelligent than that. I say, Don't you, I say, I want you to investigate about whether or not I got contraband in my cell and I come that off again. I say, here you come ask them stupid, unintelligible. I say, that's just the way you pigs think. You know what I mean? I said, you don't want to believe me. I said, but if you go check it out, you'll find out that, um, that our, uh, the cat actually didn't have the Black Panther Party paper. And so, uh, boom, the next morning, man, they come to take me to the hole. <laughs> and so, like up there, had 10 of them there, crowded all around in front of me. I said, all right, Steve, you're moving cells. I said, moving cells? I said, oh, I said, okay. I said, let me get my property. Oh, no, that's all right, John. I said, wait a minute. I said, if I'm moving cells, I said, I want my envelopes and my property and my candy and my cigarettes and everything and my legal stuff here. So I started picking it up. No, 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 no. So this one cat, ah, I'll take care of that. I said, no. I said, in other words, I said, you're taking me to the hole, ain't you? I said, that's what you're doing, talking about I'm moving sales. I said, I'm still taking my property. So I snatched my property up. And I said, I'm definitely taking my legal stuff. So I come on out of the I said, let's go. Walked on around here and went on down there. We got down there, so they say, uh, all right, or, uh, give us all your stuff. I said, you don't get my legal stuff. I said, you don't get none of my legal papers. I said, because by constitutional right, I said, I got a right. Any person accused in hell and jail got a right to keep all things related to his legal defense with him. I said, you know that. You can't have that. No, I said, yeah, I'm going to keep it. I said, the only way you're going to get it from me is take it from me. I said, because I'm keeping my legal stuff. So I said, you can have all this other stuff. I said, you can put that away. I said, my legal papers I keep with me. So I said, let's go to the hole. So I started walking towards the hole. And so they all jumped in. They all kind of, excuse me, they jumped in front of me, you know what I mean? And uh, so you got to give me, I said, you know, I ain't going to give you my legal papers. I got a right to have my legal papers. So I started to walk towards the hole again. And all of them cats grabbed me simultaneously, legs, hands, and everything. And right around the neck, they started choking me and pulling me to the ground. And we were wrestling that for a while. And, and then this cat started hitting me in the testes. This one cat who talked about, don't worry about your stuff. You know, let's just go, you know, when you get people to put me in the hole. And man, I was passing out, you know, and the cat was choking me, man. And uh, he hit me four times, man. And I remember the last time that I was just going on out, you know. That pissed me off, you know. And I had a TV interview, and he was standing back out there listening. And I saw him listening. I said, I don't know if they even showed it on TV, I said, but they say they put me in the hole for calling him a pig. I said, well, the punk, the bastard who put me in the hole and hit me in the balls in the testes, I said, I still consider him a low-life, discovery, reprobated pig. I don't even know if they put that on TV or not, but that's the way I felt about it, and that's exactly what he is. That's what he is this, this badge 41 of the sheriff's department, you see? And I got his badge number and everything, you see? The fool, you know. And I just wanted to print it in the paper so all the people in the community can know who the pig is, you know. But anyway, they put me in this hole. I woke up. What does it look like, the hole? Well, I woke up. I, oh, the, the holes are seven by seven. No, oh, seven by five. By five feet wide and seven feet long. It's just a box. There's no bed in there. You have no blankets in there. You have no toilet. You don't even have a toilet in there. All you got is a hole in the floor. It's a box. 
Well, he strangled me and to my damn throat. You know, I'm, I'm still hoarse now from that very strangle. I'm thinking about suing. Well, I was choked. After I was choked, and I just w woke up. I was in the hole, you know, and they threw some. Uh, oh, you don't have nothing on. You don't have no underwear on, no socks, no shoes. And they give you a shirt, but the shirt is raggedy. The, the stuff they got in, they got you clothes with holes in it. But a lot of cats ain't even in the hole got raggedy stuff on in here, you know. But uh, I woke up in the hole. So uh, uh, my throat, man, I was hoarse. And the, you know what shocked me the most? When I came to, I couldn't utter a word. That's how bad they choked me. And all they had a tonsillitis problem, see. And uh, they choked me. They wouldn't even let me go see, uh, I'm gonna get a, get the doctor, you know, to uh, go through my throat. Doctor find my own private doctor, or Dr. Carlton Goodlick, one of the two of them. But they wouldn't let me go see. But anyway, uh, these cats, was sitting there and I was, they were standing there in front of me, they was getting ready to close the door. I couldn't utter, utter a word. I thought, I tried to say something. And that shocked me. I thought I wasn't gonna be able to speak no more, man. That blew my mind. Pissed me off. Tell my man. And finally, after about 10 minutes in there, I said, ah, ah. And one of the cats came back and asked me, did I want some water? I said, yeah, I want some water. You know, and um, I got some water in my throat. And then I real, real hoarse, like, you know, so, 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 so. That's, but that's the way I, that's how my throat was the first day. And it swelled up, and I started running the temperature, you know, that tonsillitis stuff, and everything. So how did, how did you go to the, to the bathroom in the hole? You just had to well, we see, well, in the hole, man, this is the, you know, that hole is, 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 is declared unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court, but they still use it. They lie and say they don't, but they do. They always put cats in the hole, always brutalizing them, beating them, you know. Like the other night, well, you know the cat Raymond Scott? No. You heard of Raymond Scott who supposedly killed all them people, was accused of it at least. Oh, down on Market Street? The black cat, yeah, man. Mm -hmm. Show you how rotten, man, one of these black cats in there, these black guards. He tried to go in on Raymond Scott, man, and brutalized the cat, messing with him, you know. And then, uh, what did he do? man, he went and called a bunch of other guards, man, and went in there and they jumped on him, man, by nine or ten of them beat the cat, man. Beat him unconscious in this jail. Now the man, he's a friend of Charles Gary's too, who killed his three daughters. They don't bother him, see. Nobody bothers him, you know. He's a friend of Charles Gary? Yeah, he, well, he been know, he know all the lawyers in town. He know all the people in the government around here. You know, he's a clerk, the kid who killed his three children. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess he uh, needs some mental help, you know. And so, you know what they'll do? They will uh, probably send Raymond Scott, who probably needs some mental help, to the gas chamber with the white man, you see what I mean? They'll send him to a mental institution. You see what I'm talking about? This is, well, anyway, back to the hole, man. The hole has got a hole in the floor. It's just a flat hole, you know, you flow and it's just a hole. And one of the things about it, they had the thing stopped up. They don't flood, you can't flush it from inside. You flush this flush from outside by somebody else. The thing was stopped up. So I was in there about uh, half an hour or so, and it's flushed, but it was stopped up in a defecation and urinal, urine and toilet paper and crap come all back up in the floor, and I'm standing in two inches of water now with defecation and everything, you know. So I watch a little porthole, you know, got thick glass on it, you know, you can see through it like so. So I'm watching and see if somebody passing, every once in a while I try to bang on this door, but it's almost soundproof, you know. People can hear you kind of banging on it, but not much. Tell these dudes this damn thing is stopped up in here, you know? And, you know, and fall apart. And the cats knew they were stopped up. They knew it, you know? And not too late that night, man, when the shift had changed, you see what I mean? One of the guards had got some human sense. In fact, they'd given me some food in, the, in a plate and through the little porthole. You see, what the water recedes, flushes up and it sits there for an hour. You know, it takes an hour for it to recede back down and they flush it back up. So where were you all the time? You were Every while well, I went ahead. Yeah, I was in the middle of the crap, you know, until the stuff receded and I could sit back on the floor, possibly. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't stand up all that time, you know? Yeah. And, uh... And were you hanging up on the bars and stuff trying to... There's no up? bars. It's a box. It's a box. It's a box. There's no hole. It's a door. A big, thick door. A big, thick steel door, you know? And it's a cold floor. You have to sleep on the cold floor. You don't have no bed in the hole. It's not a... It's a seven, seven feet long, five feet wide box. So 
So what did you, you do to keep yourself fit or to keep yourself sane when you're in there? Oh, in the hole? Yeah. You see, this is where you beat the cat. See, when you're revolutionary, you don't, uh, you know, they can't break your spirit that way. You see what I mean? Uh, the real thing is you understand the psychology of the cops. They are the ones who really couldn't stand to be in there. That's why they create that kind of thing. You see what I mean? They are the ones who really couldn't stand to be in there. Anyway, my food came in there. They got some food in there. And what it was is the way they got that thing turned off, unstopped that, that plug and that hole. And me, I have said, sitting and stuff is, on the night shift, after they come back around to pick up the thing, I wouldn't hand me a uh, plate back out the porthole, you see. And uh, they open the door, and I'm over here in the corner, you know, and my plate is sitting there and all this water, defecation and crap all over the floor. I look and I say, nah, is that, is, is, I say, I say, is, I say is, is, is this you kept whole? You know, and so they come on out of that, so they clean it up and unflush the thing and got the thing all cleaned up. But uh, it's their minds, it's their scared of that hole, you see. They're the ones who could never take it, you see. But Huey one time was telling me about how he figured they psych out when he was in jail a long time ago, way before the party started. They put him in the hole because he let a, a, a strike in jail for better food, you know. And uh, what they did, they stuck you in a hole and they give you a cup of green marsh and mess, you know, and a two pieces of bread or something twice a day. And so when they first come around there, he would say, I'm not going to eat this crap, you know, because uh, I was striking upstairs for better food in the first place. What I looked like eating this crap, you kept sitting out here in the first place. So he would threw it back out for two days, he wouldn't eat. But so happened, the shift changed, and uh, a night shift cat changed. And the cat who came on night shift happened to be a brother who knew me and Huey very well, you know, at Mary College, you know. And this cat, I saw Huey down there and asked Huey, was he hungry? Uh, well, he didn't even ask him where he was hungry. What it was, he just went and got some bologna and cheese sandwiches, you know, and uh, brought them down and gave them to Huey at night. And every night he'd come on. So the next day, the way he would figure out these cats psychic was uh, that they are, uh, come down there and it blew their minds. Which when he would come down, they come down the next day with their green marsh, he would be doing push-ups, you know. <laughs> you know, and then you know how cat, this cat did that for 10 days and it blew these cats' minds, you know. How could he do it? You know, it's just impossible, you know. Well, he would reverse the understanding of his thinking. The first thing is a basic fear. It's impossible to survive in the hole. You're supposed to break your spirit, you know what I mean? But you don't do that, see. And uh, once you understand that their psychology, deep down inside, they can say everything they want to say, but them cops are really scared of that hole. That's why they create something that they fear, you see what I mean? Which makes them hate. It's a basis of hate and false fears that they have. So they create the most detrimental things. That's the basis of hate. You see, you see how they, you can describe their hate, you see. So how did you whip psycho men when they came back? In Oakland, California, the search for power began on the street. Blacks had little say in how their community was run. In particular, many questioned the role of the police. The police throughout the black communities uh, in the country uh, were really the, the, uh, uh, the government. Uh, we had uh, more contact with the police than we did the city council. Uh, the police were um, universally disliked. The size of the mostly white police force was increasing. So were complaints of police brutality. Influenced by freedom struggles in the South and in third world nations, in 1966, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale formed the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, a symbol taken from a Lowndes County, Alabama political organization. Armed with law books and with guns, the Black Panthers monitored the actions of the police in the black community. I remember one of these first events when we got out of the car. We saw a policeman, you know, making an arrest of some kind, about 20 or 30 people in the community standing to the side watching. And the black folks, one of them says, hey, who are these people? Hey, man, this guy got, hey, man, I'm going to move out of here. He got, got guns and stuff like that. They were out looking at what the police were doing we had officers uh, stopping a, a car and then we would have a, a carload full of these uh, black panther people pull up behind them and watch them and see what they were doing you know they were they were looking at what the police were doing 
we would uh, follow the police around, and when the police would arrest or, or detain someone, we would read their rights to them. And uh, it came down to some point where the policeman says, what are you doing with those guns? And Huey says, well, we got to always defend ourselves and to observe you and the police. You have no right to observe me. And Huey was all this lost, that it was in night law school at the time. Uh, California State Supreme Court ruling states that uh, everyone has a right to observe a police officer carrying out his duty as long as they stand a reasonable distance away. And a reasonable distance was constituted in that particular California Supreme Court ruling is 8 to 10 feet. I'm standing approximately 22 feet from you. I will observe you, carry out your duty, whether you like it or not. The black community saying, well, go ahead on and tell it. The boldness of the Panther actions attracted young blacks, many in their teens. Carrying loaded firearms in public was a well-protected legal right in California. But with the emergence of the Black Panthers, state officials introduced legislation to outlaw loaded firearms within city limits. May 1967. In protest, the Panthers traveled to Sacramento, the state capital. We arrived there, all these black men and women, 24 males and six females, with guns. And Ronald Reagan, then the governor, was on the lawn with 200 future leaders of America, you know, 12 and 13 and 14 year old kids. And these kids started leaving his session on the lawn and coming to see us. And these young white kids thought we were a gun club. Knowing the media would be there, the group of men and women then entered the Capitol building. Heavily armed, whether their weapons are loaded or not, nobody seems to know. Wait a minute, now wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, he was under arrest. Am I under arrest? Am I under arrest? Place him under arrest. Am I under arrest? Am I? Take your hands off me if I'm not under arrest. If I'm under arrest, I'll come. If I'm wait, not, uh, don't wait, put look. your hands on me. Is this the way the racist government works? Don't let a man uh, exercise his, his, his constitutional rights? If my sweater is ripped, you will get. I'd like to make a statement oh, now with this respect. Statement of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense on the Mulford Act now pending before the California Legislature. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense calls upon the American people in general and the black people in particular to take full note of the racist California Legislature, which is now considering legislation aimed at keeping the black people disarmed and powerless at the very same time that racist police agencies throughout the country are intensifying the terror brutality, murder, and repression of black people. A nation that had grown used to the nonviolent civil rights movement was now confronted with new images of black protests. Later, at a Sacramento service station, news cameras documented the continuing debate over law and guns. Ain't no sawed off, that's a rat shotgun just like yours. You don't know the Constitution, right? Sure we do. We're well aware of the Constitution. Why? You have no right to take my gun away from me. You bring the Constitution life. The pamphlet says that the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense calls on the American people in general to take careful note of the racist California legislature. Why do you believe the legislature is, is racist? Don't you know? You're a part of it, and you're obviously it's a white system. Is it obviously where we are? Do you believe everything that's in that pamphlet? The Black Panther Party style and dramatic actions captured the attention of the media. Yet the Panthers often disagreed with the way they were portrayed. The examiner made a report back here in the last Sunday's paper that we were anti-white, that we hold no bones, this is a quote, hold no, pick no bones about being anti-white. This is a bold-faced lie. We don't hate nobody because of their color. We hate oppression. We hate murder of black people in our communities. We hate the gross unemployment that exists in our communities. We hate black men being taken off into the military service to be fighting for a racist, decadent American prominence as freedom. To present their story and their program for social change, the Black Panthers created a national newspaper. Language and art were important tools of the new party. I knew that uh, images had to be changed. I know sociologically that um, words, the power of the word, words stigmatize uh, people and uh, we felt that the police needed a label, a label other than that fear image that they carried in the community. So uh, we used uh, the pig as a uh, rather low-lifed animal in order to identify the uh, police and uh, it worked. Some feared the reaction that the Panther's stance might provoke. We'll just 
have to get guns and be My men. parents or the neighbors would, were kind of reluctant. Uh, uh, kind of uh, standoffish in their uh, attitudes towards the Black Panther Party because here you had a new dynamic kind of uh, organization coming out doing things that never had been done in the history of this country before. Carrying guns, standing up to the police, standing up to the power structure. Eldridge Cleaver, who had gained fame from his writings in prison, was the chief spokesman for the party. And we feel that the police must be brought under control by any means necessary, including through force of arms. And we have never bit our tongue about that. We say it now loud and clear. We will always say it. We're not afraid to say it, that these racist Gestapo pigs have to stop brutalizing our community or we're going to take up guns. We're going to drive them out. As the Black Panther Party grew, so did tensions with police. In October of 1967, a year after the party's formation, Huey Newton was shot in the stomach in a confrontation with police. Police officer Herbert Haynes was also seriously wounded. Officer John Fry died from gunshots believed to be from a police revolver. With the death of a policeman, government pressures on the young organization intensified. Newton was charged with first-degree murder. He maintained he had been framed. In America, uh, black people are uh, treated very much as uh, the Vietnamese people or any other colonized people because we're used, we're brutalized. The police in our community occupy uh, our uh, area, our community as a foreign troop occupies territory. The Panthers called themselves a revolutionary organization. The 10-point program was their blueprint for change. And we wrote out this program. We want power to determine our own destiny and our own black community. Immediate end to Polish brutality and murder of black people was point number seven. The right to have juries of our peers in the courts, what have you. We summed it up. We wanted land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. The Black Panthers distributed free food and later developed a free breakfast program for children. The idea was uh, obviously twofold for the specific purpose of serving those people who were directly benef benefited by our programs, but also secondarily to influence the minds of people to understand not only that the Black Panther Party was providing them this, but more importantly that if they could get food that maybe they would want clothing and maybe they want housing, and maybe they'd want land and maybe they would ultimately want some abstract thing called freedom. Around the country, particularly in urban areas, Young black men and women formed local chapters. The party grew much too uh, rapidly uh, because many of the young people were in, uh, in very enthusiastic about the guns and about the uh, berets, but uh, uh, they knew little about the uh, community programs that they were really uh, a reason for existing. <laughs> The growing party still faced the dilemma of having its leader, Huey Newton, in prison. Court proceedings attracted national attention, bringing support to the Panthers from an alliance of white and black political organizations. You're obviously in good spirits, Huey. Why? Uh, because uh, I have the people behind me, and the people are my strength. Huey's brother's here. Move. February 17, 1968. Stokely Carmichael, James Foreman, H. Rath Brown, leaders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, now joined forces with the Black Panther Party in their call for revolution. And so in talking about Brother Huey Newton tonight, we have to talk about the struggle of black people not only in the United States, but in the world today, and how he becomes part and parcel of that struggle, how we move on 
so that our people will survive America. See, it's no in-between. You are either free or you're a slave. There's no such thing as second-class citizenship. The only politics in this country that's relevant to black people today is the politics of revolution. None other. April 6, 1968. A gun battle on the streets of West Oakland. Five men were wounded, three police officers and two Panthers. A third Panther, Bobby Hutton, age 17, was shot to death. Black people are now to organize in a fashion where we have maximum retaliation against all forms of racist, police brutality and attacks. What changes have there been in the Black Panther Party since the gunfight last weekend? What do you mean, what changes? We have a black man that's dead, murdered by pigs. That's a change. If you were a man who was saying, listen, we are willing to take charge of our lives. We are willing to stand up. I mean, there was the appeal that Malcolm had in many ways. They had a certain subjective appeal to my psyche and to my emotional need to say, yes, there were men in this world who, who cared, a black man, who, uh, who cared about the community and wanted to, to do something and were willing to, to take it to the, to, to the last uh, degree. In the fall of 1968, two years after the party's founding, Huey Newton was convicted of manslaughter in the death of police officer Fry, a conviction which was later overturned. With chapters in 25 cities, government surveillance was increasing. The membership of the Black Panther Party had reached several thousand and was growing. It was a battle. It was a struggle, and I think we rooted ourselves in, in the sense that we began to get millions of black folks to really look at where we were coming from and our stand against the power structure. Now, a lot of people call a revolution a confrontation. Really, what you and I meant by revolution was a need to revolve more political power and economic power back into the hands of the people. That's really what a revolution is. The Black Panthers continued their struggle, working outside the system. 